Now, how do you go about thinking about how to structure your introduction? How should I connect all of these ideas? There's a lot going on there, and it's sometimes it's really hard to figure out how to present it in a way that's clear and easy to follow for the readers. So let's look at this form that's called the message box. Now, this is not something I invented. I'm not sure who invented this, but it's a very useful form and it has five different parts. So you have a central section which is labeled the topic or issue and then outer sections that are labeled why is it important, what is the problem, what is the solution, and what are the benefits of solving this problem. So the way to use this form is to basically just write out the most simple and concise explanation for each of these prompts. Don't write three or four sentences here, just write a phrase. You can start in any order, it doesn't really matter which order you fill in the rest of the boxes. Answer what specifically is the problem, explain why this problem is important, explain the solution to the problem, and explain the benefits of solving it. So let's look at an example from my research. So the topic or issue is iron deficiency chlorosis or IDC in soybean. Let's start at the top. Why is it important? IDC causes $260 million in losses each year and new resistant varieties would reduce this loss. What is the problem? Well, we don't know which genes confirm IDC resistance. What is the solution to this problem? In part, the solution could be to measure gene expression in both IDC resistant and susceptible varieties, then determine genes that are highly expressed in the resistant variety. What are the benefits? These highly expressed genes could be new targets for developing IDC resistant crops. Now, this figure only took me you know, two or three minutes to explain it to you, but it took me two or three hours to do this. Uh, it's not as easy as it looks. You're going to sit down and spend some time with this form, and it's going to help you figure out how to structure the order of your introduction section. Now, before I told you to keep the introduction short, well, how long should it be? Back in one of your earlier lessons, I had you do an assignment where you went into uh, journal articles in your field and you counted the numbers of paragraphs in each section. So take a look at that. What is the average and what is the range? In my experience, four to six paragraphs should be plenty long for almost all papers. You want the readers to move through it quickly, get excited, and keep going into the rest of the paper. As you're writing the key elements of your paper, you want to make sure that the readers notice them. Don't hide them, don't make them obscured. So how do you make sure that the readers can see all of these key elements? What you're going to do is signpost them, signal and signpost these key elements. So when you state the unknowns, the knowledge gaps or problem, do it very clearly and very specifically also. So some key signpost examples that you might see are phrases like has not been determined, has not been established, is unclear, is unknown. Here's an example at the bottom of the slide from a paper that I wrote. It says, however, whether IDC results from low iron supply, alkaline stress, or a combination of these factors is still unclear. One of our objectives was to determine how pH influences physiological and molecular responses to iron deficiency in roots and leaves. So I've underlined the signpost terms. However, signals that you know, there's something coming up that is in conflict, the ending of that sentence is still unclear, is a clear signpost that I have just said something is a knowledge gap. And then I, I specifically point out the objective that's going to address this knowledge gap. One mistake that authors can make that obscures these key elements is to be indirect in their language. Let's look at an example here from Steven Pinker. He quotes from a paper, In recent years, an increasing number of psychologists and linguists have turned their attention to the problem of child language acquisition. In this article, recent research on this process will be reviewed. Okay, so that first sentence, if we read it literally, it's telling us how psychologists and linguists are spending their attention. 
You know, what are they spending their time on? What are they paying attention to? That really doesn't tell us anything scientifically about why they're doing that, why it's important, what the knowledge gaps are that they're trying to address. It's very indirect. And so it's leaving the readers to assume. And, you know, you don't know what your readers know in terms of background information. So they might assume the wrong thing and they'll be completely confused. His fix for this is to revise this first sentence as such. All children acquire the ability to speak a language without explicit lessons. How do they accomplish this feat? Now, that revision is very clear and it's very direct. It's much easier to understand. Let's now look at some introduction logic templates. So these templates are going to cover probably almost any research paper. And so we're going to look at four different templates here. The first one is we'll write some paragraphs or sentences that include facts about nature. Next, we'll talk about how the existing work explains these facts poorly. And then we move into talking about how in this paper we look for a better explanation. A second template is the topic is important and extensively studied, but something is missing and we fill in the gap. A third template could be something like this. Theories or facts seem contradictory. Our experiments will resolve the tension. And finally, society needs X technology. Current technology has this problem or limitation and we improve the technology to overcome the problem. So what you do with these templates is basically write out the information for your specific situation that fills in the facts about nature, about the existing work, about why the topic is important, and so on. Now let's look at some bad introduction templates. And these are based on papers I have actually read that set up their introduction in the ways that you see coming up here. First, the topic is important and extensively studied. Then they write a miniature review article on the topic, and then they did something related to the topic. What's wrong here is that we don't see what the knowledge gaps are, and so the research question is not well defined, and it doesn't seem important because we don't know why they're doing this research. And, uh, you know, I must admit, in the past, before I learned a lot about scientific writing, I wrote some papers that were kind of like that, and I had a hard time getting them published. And now I understand why. A second bad template would be something like this. The topic is important and extensively studied. A, B, and C are missing, but we're going to study D. So what's wrong with this template? Pointing out all of the missing knowledge in a field is not something you want to do in an introduction to your paper because it's confusing to the readers. They don't know which of those knowledge gaps you're going to be addressing later in the paper. And so it's very confusing. They don't know what to expect. And so their expectations are not going to be met and they won't be satisfied readers. So you should only point out knowledge gap D if you're going to study knowledge gap D. The third bad template is, this topic has never been done before, so that's why we did it. Now, it is good to do something that's never been done before. That's not a problem. The problem is, it's not a scientific reason. Uh, there's not a scientific premise behind doing something just because it's never been done before. 